Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dennis. And I will really want to thank um, you know DG Wells, the great bookstore here, for hosting this event. Um, secondly, I want to say I'm really happy to be back in California. <laughs> may, some of you may know that I'm spending the year visiting uh, Cornell University. Uh, as beautiful as Ithaca's fall is, you know, I really miss California. Uh, I remember uh, when I first moved to Santa Barbara about seven years ago from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I was sitting on the beach every day, and I was really bored. <laughs> um, I thought I was, you know, coming to California to be a writer uh, on the beach, um, but I had ended up having a writer's block for two years. Um, slowly but surely. The, the land of uh, Raymond Chandler and the Ross MacDonald uh, grew on me. And um, when I began to look at the landscape, you know, uh, uh, through the, the lens of these uh, master detective writers, um, even orange groves, you know, acquire some sort of kind of hardboard lingo that I, in which I feel strangely at home. Um, but tonight I'm going to talk about another master detective, an unusual one for that matter. Um, through him, um, I don't just see California, uh, I see America. So my plan is I'm going to read a, a very short excerpt uh, for about like five minutes, and then I'm going to talk for anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. And then before, you know, returning to reading another very short, you know, excerpt, um, there should be enough time for Q&A. Um, so the piece I'm going to read, uh, first um, takes us back uh, over a hundred years uh, in history. On a balmy July night in 1904, a wiry wraith of a man sauntered alone through the dim alleys of Honolulu's Chinatown. A mere five feet tall, with intense shoulders and a ramrod straight back, the man was wearing a Canton Creek blouse, threadbare trousers, and a Panama hat. A pair of dark glasses obscured the scar above his eye. His upper lip, blackened by burnt cork, gave the impression that he needed a shave. From a distance, he was unmistakably Chinese, barely distinguishable as he walked among the shuffling throng of his countrymen. The hot, southerly corner weather, which had piled the breakers high along the coast and sapped the spirit out of every living being, had departed the island by sundown. A gentle trade wind blowing in from the northeast had brought renewed energy to the city. A local boy was plucking soft tunes on his ukulele, perhaps down on the moonlit beach not far below the street, fringed, fringed with coconut palms and licked by the lazy surf. When the serenade paused, a cock miner gave out a clear-throated cry, ruffling its plumage beneath the canopy of a perfumed night. Under the sickle moon, the Chinaman reached the corner of Smith Street in the heart of Chinatown. He slowed his pace on the darkened street, where shops and the restaurants displayed clapboard signs scrawled in his native language. They had shut their doors much earlier, except for one nondescript building where he saw a glint of light escaping through an upstairs window. A faint smell flickered at the corners of his mouth. He drew a deep breath. The night air was a strange melange of odors that lingered from the oil walks and the salty tang of the Pacific wind. Through the unlit front gate, he stepped cautiously inside the building and passed by the doorman undetected. He did the same in the next three doors, each guarded by someone, each leading him deeper into what seemed like a maze of Chinese boxes. Climbing up the rickety stairs to the second floor, he turned and faced the room packed with gamblers, all Chinese, huddling over games of fantan, paikao, craps, and mahjong. The air was a mix of smut and smoke, the den ringing with curses, jeers, and the sound of clicking dice and mahjong tiles. He observed the ballyhoo through his dark lenses. Someone at the mahjong table looked up and immediately recognized the face of the infamous cop whose name elicited shudders from the spines of Honolulu criminals. Chai Lo! Before the Cantonese cry for a cop dropped to the ground, a five-foot bullwhip had uncoiled like a hissing rattlesnake from the detective's waist. One crisp snap of the whip and the entire room froze like a ga gambling hall diorama under glass. 
Only clouds of cigarette smoke still wavered. The afterthoughts of exploded firecrackers, not sure where to settle in the deafening silence. Many there had already heard of, and some had even tasted the might of this unusual weapon wielded by the former Rough Riding Paniolo. Resisting arrest would be futile, even though they knew he had, as usual, brought no backup. His whip had spoken louder than any law or gun. Telling them the jig was up, the Chinaman, known to the locals as Kana Pung, lined up the gamblers, forty in all, and marched them out of the room and down to the police station on Bethel Street. Not a single shot was fired. Kana Pung's real name was Chiang Apana. An officer of the Honolulu Police Department, he would later acquire a more fascinating moniker, Charlie Chan. His colorful exploits, like the bravado on this July night, would one day draw the attention of mainland novelist Earl D. Biggers. From 1925 onward, a total of six novels and 47 films, in addition to radio programs, newspaper comics, and countless faux fortune cookie witticisms, would make Charlie Chan, upon his fictional double, One of the most enduring cultural icons of 20th century America.、Um, as some of you may know, or some of you especially who have read the book or either the reviews out there, will know that、uh, in this book, I'm trying to tie up,、uh, you know, several loose strands, each of which、uh, is a story.、Um, as Charlie Chan would say, you know,、um, truth like football receives many kicks before reaching goal. So. In order to solve this, you know, Charlie Chan mystery, I need to give uh, this um, football truth uh, several kicks.、Uh, with each kick, hope you know, hopefully gaining me kind of different yardage, if not mileage.、Um, the first kick is, of course, you know, the story of Chang Apana, the real Charlie Chan, this rough and tumble Hawaii, you know, Hawaiian cowboy.、Um, just to tell his story very briefly. He was born in Hawaii around、um, 1871.、Um, he went. His father was a、uh, coolie laborer, you know, from Canton, who came to work on sugarcane plantations. At the age of three, Apana went to China with his parents.、Uh, he grew up in the same district as、uh, actually Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the the founding father of the Republic of China, who also actually came of age later on in Honolulu. Uh, they actually overlap, Apana and Sun Yat-sen. Anyway,、uh, at the age of ten, Apana came back to Hawaii with his uncle.、Um, he、uh, became a paniolo, that's the Hawaiian word for cowboy, and worked at ranches. He joined the police force in 1898, just when Hawaii was annexed by the United States. He almost immediately became, you know, a local legend because, as a police officer, he will walk the most dangerous beats in Chinatown,、uh, carrying a bullwhip that, you know, he had made himself.、Um, he was a、uh, master of disguise. He was actually the first undercover cop for that department.、Um, he could single-handedly, as I, you know,、um, read in the prologue, could single-handedly arrest forty people without firing a shot. So, as an illiterate man. Uh, the son of a coolie laborer, you know, if we could would use the you know the the parlance of the 19th century, he was really a man you know who would have stood no Chinaman's chance for that matter, and yet you know he、uh, made a name for himself and became the inspiration for the fictional Charlie Chan.、Uh, the second kick or the second story、uh, I'm trying to tell in the book is about Earl Dare Biggers. And that's another, to me, you know, coming from China, China, that's another amazing American story.、Uh, this, you know,、uh, young Buckeye from Ohio, with no family connection, and yet, you know, he managed to get into Harvard and became a best-selling author. Um, uh, um, Biggers was born in Warren, Ohio,、uh, in、uh, 1884, and his parents actually had to borrow money to send him to Harvard. And、uh, he did pretty well. He, he joined the, you know,、uh, Lampoon,、uh, Signia Club, and Advocate, and all these societies. And after his graduation, he went to Harvard in、uh, 1903. His last year actually overlapped with T. S. Eliot.、Um, anyway, after he graduated from Harvard, his first job was、uh, a night police, you know, reporter for a Cleveland Plain Dealer,、uh, a newspaper in in Cleveland.